So I will start, if you don't mind. Time is a very scarce good today. We don't really have a lot of time, so I will just be impolite and interrupt your discussions and kick off. I'll do a very fast introduction of Professor Mantia Diawara, who is here today. Uh, and I'll use a lot of superlatives, so if you mind, you can excuse me. But I think superlatives are just appropriate if you talk about Mantia Diawara. Um, yes. <laughs> So, well, uh, we are most thrilled to have him around, uh, not only because um, we think that he's one of the most prolific thinkers uh, of our time, but also because he found the time to come by um, upon a very, very late invitation. So he had to make a stop to Berlin on his way to Switzerland. So we are most grateful for that. So you will see I would repeat the most and most and most. In any case, uh, my introduction would basically be about uh, some three or so topics uh, in Manche Diawara's uh, practice, theoretical and practical, as fluent as they are, you know, intermingling with each other, that kind of influence uh, our own practice, um, our reflections, not only in the, for, the, for this project. We did a, a bigger project in uh, 2014, um, giving contours to shadows, and his work, in a certain way, played a very important role to that, too. Also through Edouard Glissant, but I'll come to that in a bit. So I want to mention, uh, first and foremost, you know, his work on, on identity and difference uh, in, in black literature, you know, where he, he thinks and talks about identity politics and philosophy of language within black literature. Um, it was especially important to see how he discussed the creation and enacting of, of African identity, which is something we will talk about in the panel tomorrow. And also uh, on the African diaspora, also this relationship between the African continent and Europe in literature, but also the finding and the positioning of, of, of psychoanalysis uh, in, 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 in post-colonial uh, theory, you know. But he goes on to, 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 to look at, you know, uh, concepts of deconstruction in, in, in the works of, or in relation to, to, to works of uh, uh, Franz Fanon, Edouard Glissant, and Gugi Wachiong, and a couple of others. So the next topic I would like to mention that really influenced us and our peers is, is this concept of, of, of juxtaposing uh, negritude and, and, and nationalism on the African continent in many ways, and if I understood properly, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, so a kind of saying that one of the possibilities of getting out of this closeness of nationalism would be looking, would be, for example, to look at Leopold Sedar Senghor's view on negritude. Then I'll go to the third one, which again was a milestone, and as, as, as I mentioned earlier on, that really much uh, uh, influenced us in, in, in that exhibition we did last year. Um, which was his, the interviews he did uh, and, and the film he did on, on, on Edouard Glissant. So, so most of us reading Glissant had thought that we had understood him, but we're just bluffing until we basically got to watch this film and got to read some of these interviews where Glissant could really properly, you know, based on the questions that were asked, the precision of the questions that were asked, get into, you know, explaining what he meant by relation, what the difference in relation and, and other uh, uh, topics of interest to, to him. So Mantia Jawara is a writer, filmmaker, cultural theorist, and art historian, professor of comparative literature. He's the director of the NYU's Institute of Afro-American Affairs and the director of Africana Studies program. He has authored so many books, but I would like to mention just uh, two of them. We Won't Budge, An African Exile in the World, that was 2003. But he did a lot of publication on African, uh, African and African um, Black American cinema, and uh, in search of Africa in '98. Uh, Those are the ones I know and that, uh, that are important uh, to me, uh, so to say. But he's done a lot of documentaries, and I mentioned already uh, the film he did on Edouard Glissant. So tonight he will give us a lecture with the title "Berlin: What Concepts of Reparation." So once more, thank you very much, Mantia, for, for coming to Berlin. Thank you for this incredible description of me. 
I'm going to try to search for it. Thank you very much, Bonaventure. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I also, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's a short uh, stint, but I've seen at least 10 friends you know, in one room. I haven't talked to some, I have talked to many of them already, so I'm really, really happy to be here. Uh, I'm, 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 on, uh, I'm on my way to uh, Johannes uh, Abraham uh, Jacob Museum in uh, Zurich to talk about a friend of mine who passed away, Alain Sekula, and he's a uh, cargoes, and many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with his work. And so when I, I received the uh, text message from Simon and Bonaventure, you want to come by here, so uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, yeah, that make the long uh, story short. Uh, I have, I'm a film professor, but I, I always have tec uh, technical issues. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> shouldn't be having them. I uh, make films, I teach films, uh, but they're there. So what I'm gonna propose to you is to uh, just take care of the technical part first, show the clips that I want to show, and then come back to, uh, the presentation, and then if I have to uh, recall your mind uh, to the clips, I will do that. But so maybe that's what what I'm going to do. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is uh, show you a clip of uh, a 15-minute film uh, I worked on for high school students uh, in France uh, with uh, uh, Edouard Glissant called Traversée de l'Atlantique. So I'm just going to show you maybe depending on how I feel, 30 seconds or one minute, because it's in French, so there is no point in torturing you. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it's in French, and uh, he's talking, uh, he basically is saying, it's Christophe, Colo it's Columbus who left, and we arrived. And I thought that symbolically, that really addressed the question of uh, not only African Americans in the U.S., but black Europeans in, uh, in, in Europe, you know. Uh, that whole idea of departure, middle, or arrival and return, uh, so, so I'm just gonna show you a bit of that, and then uh, quickly. S'il fallait résumer uh, ce poème mm, d'une manière uh, rapide, euh, et dans la perspective de ce que j'ai dit, j'emploierai cette phrase, c'est Christophe Colomb qui est parti et c'est moi qui suis revenu. Nous avons euh, la multiplicité de la volonté anti-esclavagiste. Et, et c'est ça que nous avons gagné et c'est ce qui est le véritable retour. I stop here. It's so difficult to cut Glissant, uh, but I'll stop this one here and show you the other clip, uh, which is on, uh, uh, which is with Wole Soyenka. It's actually a project uh, we are working on now, with, uh, which was uh, funded by the, uh, partly funded by the Goethe Institute uh, here in Berlin. Uh, it, it's Wole Soyenka in conversation with uh, Senghor. So part archive, part interview. So I'm just gonna show you a small clip of that uh, which concerns Europe. And he's uh, picking up uh, Malcolm X's statement that the chicken, yes, if he can, the chicken have come home to roost. That's referring to you black Europeans in Europe. <laughs> so that's what Wole is talking about. Uh, I thought I'd just show that, okay. It's taken from something I filmed with the French Class Foundation called Opera Disciple. Hey, for your father, 
Well, sooner or later, chickens come home to roost. <laughs> the European colonizers, slavers, they know what they did on the African continent. Same thing, Arabs, what they did on the African continent. Now there's a movement out. It's what you might call a return match. Let us count the number of European migrants on the African continent. Some of them occupying high positions, highly paid, whereas in their own countries they'd be nothing more than janitors or whatever. And now Africans are moving, risking their lives across the desert, across the Mediterranean, you know, being stuffed in, uh, in, uh, in containers, you know, paying families, gathering funds just to send one person for a better economic, you know, life and he will repatriate some money. And you tell me you cannot accommodate these people. All right, we know that, uh, especially in uh, economic hard times, uh, nations, including African nations, have a tendency to tighten the borders and so on. But to have what I call um, um, a xenophobic attitude being implanted into government policies is for me uh, a very short-sighted uh, uh, policy. And it's one which does not take into account the history of the countries from which these migrants are coming. What was the relationship of those countries to the countries into which they're going? Why are Somali uh, flooding into Italy? Why do Nigerians flock into Britain and elsewhere? Why do the Senegalese, you know, why are they found on the streets of uh, Paris and of course in Italy as well, vending goods and so on? I think the European countries have got to realize that uh, the borders are porous and humanity is mobile and uh, adopt policies which take cognition of that fact and that there's something called restitution. I'm not going to use the word reparations because that's problematic. There's something called restitution and they should look at this influx of migrants as some kind of restitution and provide for these migrants. Okay. Uh, just a couple of words about the Afra. Uh, it's a story uh, written by Kulsi Lamko from uh, uh, Chad, and what he does is basically have Senegalese, Malians, uh, Burkinabes, all West Africans do an opera. And uh, the story of the opera is basic. Uh, it's about uh, a passer, the same story, and many people want to go and cross the desert and the ocean to, with him. And the woman you see dancing happened to be pregnant and everybody want to be uh, her husband or at least the father of the child so that when they get to Europe, they will get uh, the papers. She, she would give birth in Europe and they would get the papers. And uh, that's the basic story, the plot. Uh, uh, it, it's quite interesting because it's an opera and it's an opera cast in the in African tradition. So I just wanted to, to bring that up. And, and in the Gleason one, uh, the words abyss, uh, opacity, uh, the words openness, the words uh, multiplicity, I just wanted you to uh, pay uh, attention to those. Uh, now, when I heard from uh, Bonaventure uh, to, to, to do a presentation on this project, I, I tried, started doing something that I had to stop myself at some point because I, I basically wanted to list all the becauses of Berlin, what Berlin has done, you know. Because of Berlin, and uh, let me just uh, read a few of those. Because of Berlin, Africa has been fractured and dismembered because of Berlin, the African past, the, its civilization and cultures have been methodically destroyed and 
and this remembered, and I'm taking that word from uh, Ngugi Wationgo, uh, when he say remember to uh, remember what there is a death because people have been disremembered <coughs> and so on. Uh, so that, that, that's a very much uh, Ngugi. Because of Berlin, Africa is still unable to stand up on its own and face humanitarian and uh, natural crisis. And I have a lot of because, because here that I just say, okay, <laughs> you said enough, enough about this. But it, it, it is clear that uh, slavery and colonialism, uh, and still today, uh, and then, uh, Another because because of coltan uh, in Congo, gold uh, and uranium and many uh, minerals uh, and other raw materials elsewhere on the continent, and because of the current mass immigration to the West, uh, you know Africa still serve and and this is really my point. Africa still serve as a kind of infrastructure, a kind of base, uh, in the se sense of base superstructure, uh, for not only the development of the West, uh, but for the sustenance of the West. Uh, so the, and the reason why I'm, I'm using the word infrastructure or the word base, given that we, were, we are in Germany, uh, das Kapital, uh, I'm using this because usually the base is the part that's hidden. It is shown that, or it is implied that actually it's Europe that's helping Africa. Europe helped Africa in humanitarian crisis. Uh, Europe helped Af Africa, you know, with uh, the Ebola crisis and so on. But those are symptoms and therefore elements at the superstructure. But what, what is Europe getting out of Africa? Uh, that is, in a way, reducing, uh, devaluing, alienating the, uh, the, the force, the labor, the cost of the labor of Africans. That's why I call it infrastructure. That's really the point. What is Europe doing in Africa still today? Europe, the United States, of course, uh, which is leading this. Uh, what are they doing? that kind of render invisible the uh, labor force of Africa, that alienates the labor force of Africa, that alienates uh, the raw material of Africa from Africans, make Africans foreigners in their own countries, uh, that is still making uh, the sovereignty difficult, is still making uh, a an attempt to stand up, all this because it's difficult in Africa. That's really the point. How, why is Africa still a kind of base, infrastructure of the West? Uh, you know, and why Europe is still uh, hiding that and only emphasizing the areas in which Europe, you know, the symptoms basically. The problems happen in Africa, Europe comes and fix the problems and therefore Africans, uh, this, um, basically, this is not just Marx, this is Fanon and Césaire. I, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing back Fanon and Césaire, you know, uh, who say, you know, colonialism dehumanizes people. Uh, it, it, so, so why is that and how should we uh, pay attention to that? Uh, Marx did say it well. Uh, we need a new reading of that capital, therefore only look at Specif specifically looking at Africa. How do we read uh, capital today by looking at Africa and uh, putting Africans where the working class uh, classes uh, were? Uh, I think that would be uh, something significant. I, when I finish all the, the, the becauses, I begin to look at, I say, how do we theorize this? How do we theorize, basically, uh, how do we leave Europe alone and begin to look at Africans in this theater uh, and theorize what they have been doing so far? And I'm, I'm thinking uh, not only Fano and Césaire, but I'm thinking, for example, about Mudimbe's colonial library. The, the last presentation that I caught here, uh, 
really moved me. It was brilliant because it had maps, it had uh, the law, it had the story, and so on. And that's, you know, M Mudimbe's argument in terms of colonial libraries that we, we have been destroyed to the point that we know ourselves through the missionaries' narratives, the travelers' narratives, uh, and the narratives of diff the anthropologists, and so on. So that's how we know ourselves today. Uh, Mudimbe wanted us to, to question that. I, I come back to that, because I have my, my critique of that. How do, so how do we theorize this area? I think one the best approach is to, to try, and then this is again, uh, you know, I was colonized by French people, and they like to divide things in three. So I just said, let me get three points, three important points here. Uh, and uh, I placed one uh, as you know, resistance, and then one as uh, liberation struggle, and then one as individual redemption. Now, they're not that clearly separated, really. They're not that clearly se separated, because if you look at Fanon, somebody like Fanon, who was very much into uh, liberation struggles, uh, Fanon, at the end of the day, one, uh, you know, he said in the, in the uh, in black skin, white mask, uh, that you know, he prays that uh, he will always question his body. You know, uh, he would, you know, he, he, he's looking for that individual space, uh, him, he himself, even though uh, he, most of his work, uh, you will not see this. Uh, so resistance, uh, liberation struggle, and uh, redemption. Now, uh, I had a few thoughts about the resistance. Uh, resistance really, by resistance here, I really mean uh, people, uh, and I, I can name drop, you know, from Sheikh Anta Job uh, uh, to Ngugi Watungo's uh, decolonizing the mind and so on. But by resistance, I'm basically talking about people who want to redo uh, what Europe undid, uh, you know, it's who want to go back and finish, uh, fix the maps, go back to African traditions, uh, try to uh, use, let's say, African empires, the Congo Kingdom, the, 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 the Mali Empire, the Shaka Zulu, use those as the, the golden age of Africa, as opposed, you know, just as Europeans uh, use the uh, uh, Greek thought, uh, European medieval cultures as the golden age. So there is a sense, there is a trend of scholarship that want to do that, but in a different manner. You know, there the are very sophisticated accounts coming out of this from Sheikh Antajob uh, to the, uh, to, to, uh, to the uh, Gugi Wationgos. So I don't, I don't want to, dismiss this uh, idea of resistance, this idea of redoing the map. Uh, and also, it's, it's at the African Union, people are talking about uh, uh, regionalization, which I find uh, more, uh, uh, very coherent. You know, West Africa, Central Africa, Southern Africa, and so on. Uh, redoing that map uh, is, in that sense, it's not, you know, it's not futile. Uh, it's not futile. If, for no other reason, I, I really, think that if you look at the situation in the Sahel region today, look at the situation, uh, what we see at the surface is, Mali go, uh, is France going to Mali to intervene and stop the jihadists. That's what we see at the surface. But if we look at it again, uh, as Gleason would look at that desert as an opaque space and begin to see something coming out of it, uh, strategically it's very important for France to protect Niger and the uranium. That's really the, the, one of the main reasons. I mean, they can give us million explanations, uh, uh, but this uranium, you know, in, in good forecast, extend all the way to Mali in the desert. But even if it doesn't, if it's just in, in Niger, it's worth pr protecting. So that's really one major reason why France is in Mali and why AFRICOM also from Germany here, you know, it's the US, the base is in Germany here, uh, is, uh, you know, if you go to 
Africa's best hotels today, when you travel in Africa, you share the hotel with the arm, American army, basically. You know, they say the GI men are in all these hotels uh, because they have turned this into t a, a terror war. They have turned this, again, into uh, the, the, the St. Thomas city. Uh, the, 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 the problems have become a problem of s symptoms as opposed to the real problems. Uh, you know, uh, so, uh, and meanwhile, you know, we're crossing the, <laughs> the ocean, coming here and dying, and we're being rejected here, and we are also, uh, we are also fueling political debates in your countries. You can get elected just being anti-immigrant, you know, from Sarkozy to Le Pen. In fact, that's the biggest issue in France today. Who's going to be more right-wing? You know, Le Pen or Sarkozy, you know, so, 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 so you, you have a situation like that. So resistance movements are interesting. I, crit, uh, you know, I, I throw a critical eye on the resistance movement by looking at Mudimbe and, uh, and Ngugi. Uh, Ngugi's, uh, Ngugi first, you know, uh, throws a very important philosophical questions. Uh, in order to really assume yourself and coherently think, you have to think in your own mother tongue, in your mother tongue. This is Ngugi's point. Uh, no matter what the difficulties with this, you know, we can cite here, you know, in, in Kenya, you know, uh, the more Swahili than Kukuyu, so why don't Ngugi write in Swahili instead of writing in, uh, in Kukui and so on. Uh, in any given African country, you have more than uh, at least 175 languages. So you, you have obstacles. But still, philosophically, it is very difficult. Uh, well, it's, it's very dishonest to argue with somebody who wants to theorize in his own or her own mother tongue. You know, this is Ngugi's argument. But it's an argument that is sending us back again to this uh, uh, moment of repair, repairing our wounds and so on. When I, I went to Ngugi to, to Nairobi, uh, he had just asked me, uh, he said, I'm go we were colleagues at the NYU together. He said, I'm going home. Uh, do you want to come with me and uh, do a home movie? You know, had my camera and I called my friend Balufu Bakupa from Congo. He is an admirer of Ngugi, so we just went to Nairobi with Ngugi. Uh, two things I, I will mention, the one that everybody knows, you know, uh, he was attacked. Uh, if I were Bill O'Reilly, I would say we were attacked, but you don't know Bill O'Reilly here, so that's a good, that's a good thing, you know. <laughs> so this is just American, American story. <laughs> so, but he was attacked and, uh, his wife was raped. This is the, the story that most people know. But the other story is that all the young Kenyan writers, all this, the, the new wave of African writers that people are writing about today in the New York Times, in Berlin here and so on. I'm talking about people like Teju Cole, Vinya Venga, uh, Chimamanda Adichie. Now, Kenya played, played a big role in the rise of these new, uh, new writers. And when, I, when we were in Nairobi, they came to me, they said, well, why are you making a film on Gugi? That, that's, that's old. He left. He's doing these things. And we stayed here, and we're creating a new literature. So you see, this is how the complexities, they're not, they don't even want to hear, the, any, they don't want to hear anything about language. They want to assume their modernity in Nairobi today or in, in, uh, in Lagos and so on. And uh, we are doing a kind of post-colonial discourse. We are doing a po post-colonial discourse and the very people we are doing it for are rejecting us. So my way of approaching them was, listen, Ngugi is a, a very democratic person. If you have something against Ngugi, I have a camera, you say it, and I put it in the film. And there was some, of course, in, predictably, you know, if you want to put me on the film to criticize Ngugi, I will hesitate. But many people agreed, and we put them in the film uh, because we thought that critique was interesting, and we showed a critique to Ngugi, and Ngugi responded to the critique. So, th so there is that. And, and this resistance uh, 
deconstruction is part of this deconstructive, uh, this, this uh, uh, attempt to, to resist Africa's attempt to remand, to repair, and so on. Uh, and uh, Mudimbe uh, probably is the, the most formidable scholar in, in this field uh, with Invention of Africa, but also his recent work, uh, Colonial Library. And, and their argument is that you, everything you're going to say has been, uh, it's, a, it's a toujours déjà, always already. You know, everything you said is already in the European libraries. It's the colonial library that has invented you. So when you open your mouth, like I stand in front of you, I'm already giving you a discourse, either of an anthropologist or a Derrida or somebody else. So, so, so Mudimbe has a big and that discussion in a, in a very fascinating way and uh, has been rightfully celebrated for it by the likes of uh, Mark Kazin, who's here, uh, Mamadou Jawara, Ashil Mbembe, uh, and many of the, you know, uh, generation, you know, uh, Francoise uh, Vergès, uh, who else uh, in this group. So th th there is this argument, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly intellectual, uh, compelling argument, just like Ngugi's philosophical argument. The colonial library is a compelling argument. My problem with it is that Again, just as when you go to Nairobi, the young people in Nairobi, uh, the tools that they use for their emancipation are not the debates about language, except for you know, poetics and uh, in terms of uh, uh, hip hop and so on. They use African languages a lot. Uh, but the everyday way of creating a public sphere, they usually do not worry about going back to oral traditions and uh, writing in African languages. The same way with the colonial library. The colonial library, uh, philosophically again, I think it's powerful. It's coming out of the, 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 const, uh, the, the deconstructivist tradition, but it is, uh, in a way, I have two problems with it. One, it is it's deconstruction coming late to deconstruction. Uh, and, and because of that, uh, it can only restate what deconstruction via post-colonialism has stated already. It's basically Foucault. It's, it's the, the Foucauldian argument of what is a discourse, what is the discursive space, who can speak, and how to speak, and the order of speaking, and so on. You know, in, in Le Moelle shows, uh, in the order of things, and so, uh, you know. So, uh, I think th this argument is very compelling as an academic argument. You know, it, it, as a professor, I assign it, you know, it, there is a PhD dissertation, and my students work on the ways in which Fanon is preempted by Sartre as a colonial library discourse. I think that's very important. But to make it the language of African intellectuals, I think that there is a problem there in the, in the argument of the colonial discourse. It's, 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 it, it, it's going to be blind. Because on the one hand, by saying that, yes, you are in trouble because you are repeating the same thing, you are already trapped by the discourse, uh, no matter how right you are, you are not contributing to the solution in a sense. That's, that's my problem with the colonial uh, library discourse. So I, 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 and, and, and I, again, I'm talking about people here that I admire very much who are also my teachers. Ngugi uh, was not only uh, uh, one of the most celebrated African uh, professors, and uh, writers, novelists, but uh, you know, we were also colleagues and he was my teacher in that sense. And Mudimbe, I did the first uh, collection of uh, uh, essays on Mudimbe before he was put into English and uh, become famous. So these are people I admire who also taught me how to think, literally, you know, the same way, you know, uh, one would say Fanon and Glissant uh, taught me how to think. Now, let's come to the, 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 the liberation struggle. Uh, liberation struggle, I, I really, I went to, you know, I'm teaching a class on Fanon and Glissant this semester. So I went to that uh, 
Presence African meeting 1956. You know, all men, uh, you remember the photograph, 1956, uh, only two women, the wife of Ali Job and the wife of uh, uh, the president of Haiti, you know, so, and so on. But seminal uh, conference where Césaire uh, <coughs> talks about the limited, uh, the unwilling gift of Europeans. They colonized us, uh, the thesis of the Berlin Treaty to give us, to civilize us, to send us to school, to, to bring us into modernity. But they had a very, they, they were not willing to give us a real gift because the Africans were willing to go to school. But French people didn't educate them. Uh, British people didn't educate them. They, they just educated a minority of people that could work for them. That's basically what they did. And once African willed real education, then decolonization has to be, become an issue in Africa. So uh, using Malinowski, Césaire's essay in that 1956 conference is very fascinating when he <coughs> talked about the, the limited gift, you know, and the, the concept of gift, of course, you know, is coming from Malinowski. Uh, and then Césaire also using Hegel uh, made the argument that when uh, the Ottoman Empire colon, uh, colonized the Greek, no poetry came out of Greece because colonialism kills. Colonialism atrophies. Colonialism you know, just uh, takes you everything away from you. So it, it, it was at that 1956 conference that Césaire first said, uh, there is no culture but national, you know, national culture. In a, this, many people took this only as a critique of negritude because negritude was there uh, celebrating both uh, subjective negritude, the rhythm, the intuition, the emotion of black people versus uh, the Hellenic, uh, the rational, uh, rationality of white people. Uh, or the subjective negritude, uh, the objective negritude meaning uh, the, the empires and all the, uh, the music, uh, all the things that one can point a finger to and say, yes, Africans had a civilization because they had these empires and he named them. Yes, they had a civilization, look at their mask and their statutes. Look at, they had a civilization because look at their religions and so on. But Césaire and Fanon says, well, so what good is that if it cannot help you to defend yourself against the colonizer? So it's only by having a nation that you can create a culture that can help you uh, uh, shine in this world. So decolonization become really uh, the, 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 the number one struggle among people in that sense. And I think that, that, that was very important. And uh, it also took us to a point where, it, you know, nationalism actually become our undoing. And I think that's what uh, uh, Bonaventure was uh, referring to earlier in the introduction. Uh, we fought because Europe told us in order to become free, you have to be nations like us and you have to be democracies like us. Now, biggest problem about this is that earlier I was telling you that uh, France is democratic. Uh, UK is democratic. In fact, these two countries between them can say, and the US, we invented democracy. <laughs> Forget about the Greek, they can say that. So, but, but they had the biggest colonies. How could you be a, a, a democracy and have so many colonies? You know, this contradiction. And now they're asking us to have, again, democracy. They, you know, so really, I think this is a serious <laughs> problematic that, that we, we have, but I don't think Fanon and Césaire saw that. I don't think Fanon and Césaire saw uh, what Sécouture was going to become. I don't think Fanon and Césaire saw what Algeria was going to become. Uh, in fact, Fanon would go as far as to state that a, a liberation struggle is not a racist struggle. You know, 
uh, he, you know, he says that not only in the, in the, in the essay, in the 56 essay, but also in, uh, in the chapter on national culture in, uh, in the wretched of the earth. Some of you may remember that. You know, that's probably one of the most important chapters. Many people go to the violence chapters again, but on national culture is, the, for me at least as an African, uh, figuring out my way, uh, that, that's a very important chapter. So, uh, Fano, Fano says this, uh, they engaged us in a nationalism that today, if, when you look at African nationalism today, it is there uh, to actually lack, uh, to, to do the job for Europe again. To, you know, to, to, to get a, to come to Europe, you have to have a passport and a visa. So the African countries that are used basically to stop Africans from getting out of Europe. An exaggerated uh, a, a comment on this is Libya. When Gaddafi began to uh, uh, threaten Europeans, if you attack me, I'm gonna send all the Africans, because he was keeping all the Malians and uh, Nigerians and all these people in Libya. I think you remember this. And then we had, I think, Lampedusa become an issue because Europe began to attack its allies, whether it is uh, Assad or Gaddafi or you know, different leaders in Africa, because they're there to keep Africans from getting out of Africa. So if you don't maintain them, these dictators, then they let people go out. And as the opera was showing, people don't have jobs in Africa because all our priorities are set on now fighting terrorism, maintaining dictators, uh, having democracy and transparency. And you know what that means, even in Germany here. You know, so it's not just uh, in African countries, it's in France and everywhere, it's in the US. People are being attacked for corruption all the time, but people think Africans invented corruption. People think Africans are not transparent. <laughs> you know, so, but anyway, uh, it, nationalism has become a, one, if I were to cite them, it's, it, it, it hinders mobility. You can't come up, you, can't, you are in prison in your own country. You can't get out of your own country because France want Mali to keep Malians in Mali and the other places like that. Uh, you can't find a job in your own country. There are no jobs. And, you know, they want you to be proud of being Malian and to be proud of being Malian is to say Mali is better than Cameroon. <laughs> so you have to be against you know, your neighbor basically. Yeah, to be a good African you have to be better than the other African. That's what nationalism is doing to people. Uh, and nationalism also you know, is only there to maintain intellectuals. I mean Samir Amin for example, his whole idea about dependency uh, which really is defending the nation state and sovereignty. These are the biggest, war, uh, the worst enemies for Africa today for me. Sovereignty, uh, national integrity. When people cannot, you know, I cannot travel to Africa to look for a job. I cannot travel to wherever there is prosperity to look for a job. I cannot forget about Europe. So you have the intellectuals, you know, creating big theories about na nation and nationalism and sovereignty, which are discussions that are pertinent at the UN, so France can invade Mali. You know, France will say, well, if Mali asks me, I will come. And then one Malian leader asks France, France goes to Mali, <laughs> you know. So they don't ask Malians, really, <laughs> you know. So, so it, you know, it, I mean, there is a dark side to this story also. I have to be honest. Uh, my brother, you know, uh, when the fundament, the jihadists, I don't even know how to call this. I think it was Mujao. When Mujao was coming from Mopti down to Bamako, I was really worried. I called my family. And my brother said, well, Mancha, you are Muslim, aren't you? So to him, I have to say yes. So I said, yes, of course. And then he said, well, then what are you afraid of? So it's complex situation. He thought, he thought that Mujao coming to Bamako, if you, are, if you are a Muslim, you shouldn't be afraid of. Because 
It's just your Muslim brothers coming to Bamako. And I know they would kill my brother <laughs> first. He would be the first one to be killed. Um, I mean, there is a, the same situation with Timbuktu today, the Abdraman Sisako's Timbuktu, which uh, uh, as of yesterday was withdrawn from the competition in Ouagadougou at the African Film Festival. Now, there are all kind of pressures. They say it's for security reasons. Abdraman want to go, uh, Burkinabe say you are out. I don't know what's gonna happen, uh, really. So I know these issues are more complex than I'm just uh, explaining. That they're more complex from within and so on. You know, my brother's example, the Timbuktu example, and uh, and, and Mali and now uh, are up in arm. You know, they, they forget that Abdraman is probably more Malian than Mauritanian, but they think that he made a Mauritanian film against Mali. So that's the problem of nationalism, you know. So, uh, but let, let me move quickly to uh, my point about reparation uh, and individual redemption. Here, I'm really gonna, I'm going to talk about a work I've already done on Kaderatia, uh, who lives in Berlin here and then uh, on glissant. Uh, we're not talking about ambivalence. When I talk about the individual redemption, I'm not really talking about, I mean, those of you, so people who know me, I don't have a lot of patience with ambivalence and hybridity, so that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, uh, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking more about hospitality, thinking about uh, Wole Soyenka's clip. You know, uh, the clip that you saw. Hospitality, uh, an old word, a, a, an overused word. Senegalese call it teranga, but it's, hospitality is in every African country. But it used to be a big concept in Europe also in the 16th century, you know, uh, with people like, uh, you know, uh, the encyc encyclopedists, you know, uh, Diderot, Rousseau, and so on. But I'm talking about hospitality uh, in how we live together, and, and that makes uh, Gleason's notion of uh, relation very important. So let me, you know, I think I've been going on uh, too long. Let me read that, make it faster. Uh, I said, the reader would have noticed by now that the other is perceived differently here than with such post-colonial thinkers as Said, uh, Baba, and, the followers, and their followers who remain faithful to the Fanonian definition of uh, this, this difficult concept. As we know, the other for Fanon was an other of decolonization, an other who was against or opposed to. Now, Fanon is more complex in this, because, because Fanon is saying in, in black skin, white mask, that both the black person is sick with an inferiority complex, which is a kind of supplement in addition to your Oedipus complex. You also have the racist complex, because they're looking at your identity is defined from outside. It's, it's that, that child on the uh, train in Paris, and the child uh, on, on the mother's lap say, mama, mama, a black. So you are being defined from outside. That, this is Fanon's point. Uh, uh, and the, the counterpoint to that that Fanon really brilliantly uh, illustrates in Black Skin, White Mask, again, is that he also said the white person also is ill with narcissism, with superiority complex. And Fanon will go on, and, and uh, people don't pay attention to this. Fanon is saying, if you are a normal white person, you're not the subject of my study here. I'm not talking about you. you know? I'm talking about the, uh, the black people who are affected with this inferiority complex and the white people who are affected with this superiority complex and how they look at each other in the mirror, really, and how you ha you, your whole life, you have to spend your whole life either being like the other or destroying the other. And Fanon gives the examples of racing and when a black person runs faster than the white person, then this narcissism collapses, the body collapses and so on. So Fanon is not talking about, you know, quote unquote, normal people. <laughs> you know, that, that, that. Fanon is talking about this, you know, uh, 
minor, minority. They had power, but it's a minority of people, both blacks and whites. Because Fanon said, if an African grows up in Africa, in an African community, you know, his neurosis will be up to a kind of Freudian uh, complex. Uh, you know, from Oedipus to abandonment, uh, uh, anxieties. But you begin to control that. But once you are thrown in a white society, and then you encounter this white gaze, that's when you begin to uh, develop, uh, your body collapse, you begin to develop all kind of problems. This is, so, so my reading of Fanon, you know, I, I may have made it seem simpler, but it's, it's more complex, but it definitely is not. It, Fanon's ambivalence really has to do with how the bodies encounter each other and destroy each other in the mirror and so on. That's what Fanon's ambivalence. Fanon doesn't, both Fanon and, and, and Césaire did not like to talk about hybridity or creolization or, uh, or creole language. Fanon, in fact, was violently against this that Gleason was, will later uh, uh, try to uh, defend. Uh, so. My argument uh, with Fanon I may have uh, made it seem simpler. It is an other that could not be defined outside of the context of national liberation, national culture, and national sovereignty. And I'm going back to the wretched of the earth here. Uh, the proponents of postcolonial studies took this Fanonian binary conception of the other to another level beginning with Said's writing on culture and imperialism and his thesis on orientalism and Spivak's definition of the other as a subaltern who cannot, be, uh, who cannot speak inside a Western discourse, even if it purports to be liberation, uh, decolonizing, or Marxist. You know, it, I think we all familiar with uh, uh, Spivak's famous essay called "Can the Subaltern Speak?" Uh, yeah, so we all fam familiar with that. Uh, so the other is someone or something that we speak with in the world that we are all. Part, you know, so I'm saying, if it, if you look at the other that I'm talking about here, uh, that I'm drawing both from Gleason, but, but for, from the installation of Kader Atia, which was in Berlin here, uh, but also move, moved to Documenta and later on went to New York. Uh, it's called the Repair. I think some of you are familiar with uh, this in installation. Kader Atia is uh, of uh, uh, Algerian origin, uh, born in Paris, uh, lived in Congo and other places, and now uh, he lives in, in, in Berlin. Uh, in this sense, Every identity, so, so if we look at the other in, the, in terms of hospitality, uh, something that we speak with in the, in, in the one world defined by Gleason, that we live with, uh, then the other is part of us in, in a sense. The, this, this is the other I'm talking about. In this sense, every identity is sustained through its relation to the differences of an other identity. So it's all of us, it, in a sense, relate to each other as others, as opposed to just black and white, or men and women uh, uh, description that we have uh, earlier in post-colonialism. The other uh, grows out of its relation to, to us in a rhizomatic manner where, with Gleason. We are in the world of multiple identity positions multiple relationship to the other, where new possibilities arise and we find the fulfillment of our own identity in our search for the other, our identification uh, with his or her problems. Glissa, in an ironic uh, twist, uh, states that Fanon's search for the freedom of, for Algeria, for example, led him to discover his own, his own identity. And I, I really... I, I think this is insightful because Fanon was so upset in, in France because of racism, you know, rightfully so, uh, that it took Algeria, the embrace of Algeria really for Fanon to find himself. 
uh, in fact, Fano and Gleason grew together. They, they were uh, you know, this, uh, virtually the same age with one year difference. Uh, and Gleason would always say to me, you know, Fanon was perturbed until he went to Algeria. You know, so uh, it, 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 it's, it's a kind of scandalous expression, but I think it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, it, is with, uh, it, it is with his inst new installation, the repair, that Kadera Tia fully addresses what Gleason has often called uh, uh, la, compli la complexité monde, our relation to the other as subject and object, and the subsequent difficulties that emerge from the encounter. We see all the possible representations uh, of the other in the repair project. Le Gueule Cassé, broken jaws, you know, the, after World War II and World War I, you know, you had people who were wounded. Uh, so the installation is a little bit about that wound, the photograph of wounded people and then African statutes and so on. So he put them uh, in, in the room. It, it was a very compelling uh, installation. Broken jaws of World War I, uh, the traumatized bodies, the bodies for exhibition, the repaired bodies, the fet fetishized bodies, the aestheticized bodies, objectified bodies, bodies of people, white bodies, black bodies, bodies of Africans, bodies of Europeans, bodies uh, carved in wood, bodies uh, stitched in clothes, masked bodies, tattooed bodies, uh, hollowed bodies, protruding bodies, and bodies locked up in boxes like stereotypes. In, his, in this multiplicity of bodies, we find the body as opposed to the body against the hyphenated body, the relayed body, and the rel uh, relative body. The common ground for all these bodies is that they are all looking for reparation. And, and I think that's what all our problem, we are all looking for some kind of reparation in, in life in a way. Uh, they all need something else to make up for something missing. They're all striving to achieve a perfect state in the world, a, comp a compensation for some kind of lack, an amputation or something perceived as a due. As a reparation artist, Atia makes us revisit through this installation, Europe's debt to Africa for the Atlantic slave trade, colonialism and the current mutilation of indigenous populations and their environments through mining and wars. Thus, the show takes on at least two levels of signification. First, we see that a broken body is a body that has had a weakness introduced into it, a hole, a hole a hole that, if now repaired, become a sign of trauma. We need, therefore, to repair the hole or the fissure by covering it up, stitching it, or decorating it with other scars to reappropriate it and make it familiar. It is, this sense, it is in this sense that different ethnic groups in history have demanded reparation for crimes committed against them. Some of the African masks that Atia uses in the repair were also used in traditional performances as symbols of ancestral uh, deities who were called upon to repair damages caused by natural disaster and epidemics. And you can see this everywhere in African art, uh, but the best part for me is that things fall apart. All the, the re different Achebeza, Chinua Achebeza, things fall apart. Whenever something is wrong, the mask come out and they dance and figure out a solution. Uh, our understanding of reparation in this sense has the meaning of the restoration of a value. A value uh, that had been taken away in so far as we think that damage was committed against us that has not only weakened us but also taken a vital force from us. We feel that we could only fix it through the payment of a debt, a legal settlement, or a psychological approach to the problem. There is another level of understanding the show at, uh, and uh, Atia's concept of reparation. 
Uh, walking through the installation, one of the uh, first things we realize is that the broken faces of black and white, masks and people, uh, utensils and human faces are interchangeable because their scars are relatable. They each construct a lieu commun, the myth of which can be shared with the state uh, in which the others find themselves. And lieu commun really, I'm, uh, with a, a hyphen li a linking uh, lieu and commun, I'm, I'm borrowing it for, from, uh, from, uh, from Glissant here, uh, same way that the Bactines will be using chronotop. By lieu commun, he's, Glissant looked at this by looking at uh, protest movements around the world. That's it. A Leo Come, you could have, when you have the indig uh, indignados uh, in Spain, you have Occupy in, uh, in New York, all these areas. So, uh, so Glissa is opposing his Leo Come with an hyphen uh, uh, to the French Leo Come, which means common, common sense, common ground, uh, banality. So, so Glissa is making his Leo Come as. A, a revolutionary uh, space again, so that's what I'm using there. We need, therefore, to change our imaginaries in order to begin to see the relation between the different disfiguration in the installation. And again, this is Glissant. When uh, he talks about terrorism, he says he cannot fight terrorism by killing the terrorists, uh, because other terrorists will come and take their place. He said, the best way to fight terrorism is to begin to change people's imaginaries. Of course, you don't own people's imaginaries, but as we begin to exchange our imaginaries, talk to each other, then we begin to identify with each other, and then we begin to see things in newer ways. You know, that's what he meant by imaginary, uh, which is a difficult word to translate in English uh, in, in many ways. What, uh, so what Glissant had to say about repair, uh, what Glissant has to say about repair is equally profound. For him, along a permanent reparation beyond political and civic action is possible if we seek out the other and tremble with the, uh, the other. And Glissant here is, you know, he's dealing with uh, uh, building on what he has been called, calling la pensée du tremblement. You know, the pensée du tremblement is again difficult to, to, to translate, but if you contextualize it, uh, it has to do, uh, Martinique has Le Mont Pelé, you know, a, a, a place where there is a, you know, a, a volcano er, erupts. So there is a earthquakes and then you also have volcans and so on. And that trembling in the past, human being used to speak the language of the earth. They know what is happening. They know it's going to be earthquake or a, volcan a volcanic eruption two months ahead of time. They, but they also know where the river is going. They spoke the language of nature. This is very close to negritude, but Glissa is being more poetic here. And he says that you need to have, a, so my translation is uh, quakeful thinking. As opposed, you know, because I don't know how to translate otherwise, pensé de tremblement, the, the thought of uh, uh, trembling, tremulous, tremulous thinking, quick, quickful thinking. It's a, you, your body, your mind, your imaginary have to reach that point in order to understand the person who's injured in, in front of you, in order to begin to identify with that person. The, 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 this is what Glissa meant by la pensé uh, de tremblement. A quickful or tremulous thinking, Glissant argues in Philosophie de la Relation that faced with the misfortunes that strike people around the world every day, a quickful thinking could open the door to a long-term reparation, beginning by changing the imaginaries of the world. He states that myth and poetry find the condition of possibility in quickful and, and doubting and doubtful, doubting thought. Uh, if, even good philosophers must find their vocation in thoughts that are uncertain. I mean, this is a big contradiction because philosophers, scientists, they think they know everything. 
we know the solution. Just let the people die in the ocean in Lampedusa. You know, don't let them come in here. Let's go arrest everybody, you know. So, uh, Gleason is saying even the good philosophers should begin to, to, be, uh, to think uh, with uncertainty. And of course, for him, the poets are the best. Uh, timid, uh, he, he, you know, he promotes uh, or proposes timidity, uh, intuition, and opacity. Uh, opacity really is a word that Gleason likes to use a lot. I, I will refer you to an essay by Teju Cole written recently uh, in the New York Times on uh, the photography of Roy de Carava. Uh, that essay, there is a short passage where Roy de Car uh, Teju Cole, Teju Cole is a New Yorker writer, photographer, who wrote the book called Open City. He's a Nigerian of Nigerian descent. Uh, so he wrote this essay on Roy de Carava's uh, photography, and at some point, he basically said, uh, well, the, the, photo the photographs are about the civil rights movement, the march. So you see Malcolm X, you see Martin Luther King, but in the middle of that, suddenly you see a woman someplace. Uh, she doesn't really look like a marcher, but as he began to look at it, the lighting of the photography, her, the, the darkness of her skin, uh, and how you look deeper and deeper, you begin to realize something that is as important as Malcolm X and uh, Martin Luther King photographs. Uh, and he said he, had, he used uh, Gleason to get to that point. It's, it's a piece about four or five days ago in the New York Times, and it's called The Many the deep colors of black, just put Teju Call New York Times, you know. but it's, it's a very good essay, and uh, it, it, you know, expounds on Gleason's notion of uh, opacity beyond uh, the things that I, I have been doing. Uh, he said that myth and poetry find a condition of possibility in quakeful thinking. Uh, even good philosophers had, had said this, to Gleason thought that do not tremble are frozen, systematic, and sterile. A people that only embraces themselves and their culture are, as the only culture embraces nothing. So uh, that's for Gleason. The quick full thought is thus the very condition of reparation of our disfigured selves, searching for over disfiguration to identify with, to tell their stories, and relay them with our own stories. The repair by Atia tells the story of our girl Kasi and teaches us how to reappropriate them as a vital force, site of relation and creolization, as the first obscure poetic and mythic scream of a man on earth. Uh, I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you. I'm so proud. Thank you very much. I, I'm more than elated. Thank you. <laughs> I, I was so nervous coming here because I'm not a specialist of the Berlin Conference. So you are very generous. Thank you very much. You know. So, so, uh, and also the plane, the jet lag, and all of that. So you could see my thoughts out fighting to find them. So, uh, okay, but thank you very much. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, my dear, for, for, the, for the brilliant talk. We'll do it this way. We, a, a taxi is coming to pick you up in 15 minutes. No. <laughs> <laughs> I want to stay here. Watching your time. So, so um, we might just call the taxi. Uh, so we'll take one question, maybe one and a half. But Let's then, take three questions, man. Okay, Come on, I can three miss the plan <laughs> and make it the problem of uh, Jorgen Buck. Okay, good. Who's okay, the then, German then, curating then, this show? Okay, then uh, two questions. <laughs> He's German, you see. This is why we have to talk about <laughs> reparation. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> you have to play with African time. <laughs> so, the plane doesn't respect that one. <laughs> So, uh, Anna. Thank you very much, uh, Mantia, for this really deep and dense uh, 
talk that I um, really appreciate um, that you took your time and came. Thank you very much. I just wanted to add something um, because I think it's one of the foundations that you came um, to into your talk every again uh, at the end and you mentioned it earlier and that's the question of language and poetry and writing and also what you said about a younger generation and the Kenyan generation and maybe you can even <coughs> see that as a broader um, example on their uh, relation to Ngugi and in 2010 Kwani organized uh, the Kwani Lit Fest um, especially trying to connect the, the, the contemporary generation of writers to you know, earlier generations of Kenyan writers, especially um, the ones, uh, you know, of the uh, generation of Ngugi. And the auditorium was packed with young people. Yes. And the question that Ngugi asked, and I don't know for how many decades he's been asking this question to the same result, mm -hmm. the audience was, how many of you have written, I don't know exactly the numbers, but 10 novels in their mother tongues, no arms raised up. There were about 500 sure. young students yeah, at the yeah, uh, yeah, at the yeah, university yeah. in Nairobi. Yeah. Then he, he went down. How many of you have written five? He also, maybe two hands raised. Then three, and then one. So that was, the, you know. And we all know that he's been dealing with these questions for decades now. So maybe it's the kind of the depression with that he still has to ask these questions to these results <laughs> that yeah. people try to not engage maybe with his work too mu so much um, anymore. Um, yeah, but on the other hand, I mean, we have a, a, a Kenyan writer here and playwright who translated Shakespeare to Swahili. He's only the third uh, one so to so do so. Nyerere. Yes, that's what I wanted to say. Okay. There are three people, Nyerere, mm -hmm. who else? Okay, another one who's Maybe been Shaban forgotten. Maybe Saban, 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 Saban yeah, Roberts, Saban, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. And Ugutu Mariah, the okay. third one. <laughs> so, yeah. I just well, I need to know your name in case I name drop then. <laughs> Because I know they too. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm here. Ah, yes. <laughs> um, that was wonderful, um, and it so so tightly connected actually to the discussions we had before throughout the whole day. And um, uh, and who was here before knows what I will refer to now um, about this notion of sovereignty. I mean, I was uh, really, really happy that you basically bashed it to the ground. And um, in this few more mo moments where we have, you know, maybe we can uh, a little bit uh, explore further on, I, I absolutely agree with you on that, and I just have this thought, you know, um, connecting it back to democracy when you said, you know, I'm not so much agreeing with that democracy is owned by France. I mean, <laughs> you can have it, but I think uh, we really need to look into ancient Greek because here we see that not everybody is included into democracy. So I actually think that's exactly where we need to go back, and that's where we also see that sovereignty is not for everybody. Yeah. So I can absolutely follow you in why this is a problem on the African continent. So I wonder, you know, if, if you can, you know, just hit us with a couple of ideas how we should think of, you know, decolonizing this whole notion of sovereignty for the African continent. Right. I think this is a, it's a crucial question because I, I'm from Mali and I grew up uh, in Guinea for about five years, went back to Mali, and then uh, went to France, like most uh, African students uh, who went through high school. Uh, but Mali is too small for me. Uh, you know, I want, when I'm in Mali, I want to feel Guinean. And now I have a place in Senegal, I want to feel Senegalese. I want to feel Mauritanian. So, but the nation is actually preventing this from happening. You know, Pan-Africanism, you know, I didn't say a word, uh, but you know, in my paper there is Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism actually look up to that. Uh, you know, uh, problem, my, my key problem with sovereignty is that, uh, or democracy, is not that I'm against them, even though I am now, okay? <laughs> uh, but they have been hijacked. They have been hijacked, let's say, uh, in the Mali invasion, it gave me, I, I, I 
I thought a lot about this because all my friends, the best ones from the left, Aminata Draman Traore, who's my sister, but also my friend, uh, Sekmar Sisoko, who is a great filmmaker, they all began to claim sovereignty. But behind the claim for sovereignty, they were also basically uh, trying to fight to rule the country. They wanted to come to power uh, in many ways. So we didn't really come to blows, but we indirectly attacked each other because we're so close. Uh, so I realized, you know, look at the word, Ablai Wad of Senegal, many of you may know. Now, Ablai Wad enhanced the, uh, Senegalese democracy by challenging Senghor and Juf for 25 years. So really brought Senegalese democracy to a certain level. But when he became president, he destroyed Senegalese democracy. He didn't want to go. And uh, yesterday, Ablai Wad called his uh, successor a slave. He said, you are a slave. If we were in the olden days, I would have sold you. This is what? I'm not talking about a regular African. You know, I'm not talking about, you know, and this is in the newspapers from Le Monde to Jeune Afrique to RFE and so on. So then we know that we are becoming like the, the Europeans. We, 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 we use democracy and sovereignty f for interest. If it's in our interest, we do it. Now, I know it's very difficult to come to this area where we can really distribute rights, uh, equally distribute rights, but uh, there was an honesty uh, that can be measured in, from 56 to 1960 to 62 to the death of Fanon, where people, the role of the intellectual was well defined, the role uh, of the nation was well defined, and we all support that, and that role taught us how to think. But it, it, was, it was from 1966 on the first coup d'etat, all of that become ideology, and, and I think that's the problem. And, and I think the UN and the African intellectuals, including myself and the European intellectuals, we feed on sovereignty and democracy. We, got, we have more to gain, the UN especially, all those international functionaries in New York, they have more to gain by keeping sovereignty and sending international advisors who are being paid $500,000 a year and uh, to people who do not get uh, $5 a day. You know, so sovereignty just has been uh, emptied of its meaning in many. That's why I go against it, because it's sovereignty that's really our biggest enemy today. You know, personally, I bring my people from Mali to go to France, knowing the difficulties that they are going to, to face, because if they don't do that, they're not going to get anywhere. Uh, so we have to learn. I mean, I, I'm not answering this question. I'm sorry, because my brains are not really there. But I, I think it's a very important question. So then I'll, I'll take the last one, which will come from me. I have. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll beg you to, to keep it short, keep the answer short. Okay. So, well, it's, it's again about this. Um, I mentioned it in the introduction about the negritude being a possibility of leaving this con this this right. this nation state this this you know this nationalism uh, concept. But then in your I think in in your interview with with, with Glissant, you asked him about negritude and he said something about it being legitimate for its time right. back then. Right. So because uh, and my question is, uh, would negritude the concept of negritude not negate the concept of difference in a certain way? And which uh, Glissant in himself says you need that difference to be able to create a relation. Right, right. You know, so. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, you know, negritude, I mean, you, we all know the fortune of negritude. Uh, I think when Senghor was big, uh, forced to define negritude, that's when he went wrong. Because he was, on the one hand, a politician. Uh, in France, he was a deputy all the way to minister, but he was, on the other hand, a poet. And he began to, he became literal because you have to understand Negritude is a movement created by high school students. 
you know, they were in high school. Cesar, Senghor, Damas, they, they were in high school. You know, they were not, you know, people, university people like yourself. And they had a lot of feelings. They read African Americans, Harlem Renaissance, and so on. So on the one hand, yes, they wanted identitarian position. They, they wanted that. It was very fixed. But on the other hand, the, the biggest project of Negritude is to show African cultures as universal cultures. And you can't have universalism without difference. You really, you know, the, because both Glissant, Fanon, Cesar, they define universal as a, an amalgam of particulars. So they wanted an, an African particular there that European can also use. So it's that part of negrity that can accommodate uh, difference. The, the problem, I mean, Glissant was my friend, but the problem with Glissant and Fanon, not Fanon, Fanon was different, Cesar was different, but the Creolite movement, they made the discourse Caribbean discourse. It's between us and Europe. Let's leave Africa out. It's later, people like Paul Gilroy make even that worse. Africa doesn't count. So the Caribbean discourse of Creolite really, or the black European, black German is all between us and the white, pe and the white people. But the negritude and the, the latter glisson was two mond, the one world. And I think we have to go to that one world. And that one world has to include Africa. Okay. If I may, I just. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 